All right, everyone, how are you doing today? Uh, if, feel free to move closer if you want. Uh, we're going to just have a nice conversation about fashion in the world of fashion and where we're at current state and where we're going. I'm going to be your host. I'm Ryan Kiner. Uh, I currently uh, own uh, Social Monet, which is a, a business that uh, brings people together. I do events around the city. My region is the Midwest. I also co-founder of Nora Whiskey. We started the whiskey company with Tavon Coney and Malik Zaire, our former football players at Notre Dame. And then also, I was just talking with the fellas that um, I used to work for LVMH, Louis Vuitton, Hennessy Moet, it's one big company, and um, I always enjoyed the fashion industry, and uh, uh, here we are. So these three gentlemen are going to introduce themselves, and then we're going to get started. Hi, I'm Tommy Flame, uh, founder of Fox and Robin and Act for a Brand. That's why I'm a little more casual than the rest, probably. Um, graduated in 2016, majored in finance, uh, minored in education, schooling, and society, and then went to do investment banking after college, and now I'm working on this full time for about a year and a half. Um, my name is Kyle Wang. I'm a 2008 graduate. Uh, I started ESQ um, traditionally, or up until a couple of years ago, it was just high-end bespoke menswear. We're getting into e-commerce now as well. Um, so you may have seen, uh, we outfit the Notre Dame football team in custom jackets every week. We dress all the coaches here, but we do work with a lot of affluent and, and fairly well-known celebrities and professional athletes uh, and, and normal people as well. Um, this is 10 years for me now, uh, and used to be a lawyer, hence the name ESQ. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it's good to be back. Hey everyone, I'm Eric Wong. I'm a uh, 2013 graduate in entrepreneurship. Um, started a company called Ashineery, make everyday clothing for shorter men. Uh, we were in Shark Tank in 2017, right? Um, we've also raised money through Irish Angels and also the University itself, actually, directly. Um, and we, you know, our goal basically is to be the first major brand for shorter men. And at this point, we have clothing in pretty much every category. So jackets, jeans, button-down shirts, you name it. Awesome. All right, so let's get into this. So when it comes to fashion right now, um, you know, uh, 2020 is a big factor when it comes to fashion and the way that people uh, present themselves. What are some of the things that you've seen that was great in your industry when it came to 2020 and how did that affect your industry? Yeah, um, and just to clarify, so 2020, you mean like the pandemic, how yeah, that affected? Pandemic, yeah. yeah um it did impact Tried so to say it, you know yeah 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 <laughs> <laughs> that boo. um so given that we're active we're in athleisure it did positively there's pros and cons i mean the supply chain side of things we manufacture in southeast asia so it definitely we incurred a lot of delays um so from that side of things it definitely wasn't great but from a customer demand standpoint it was beneficial just because a lot of people were working from home, we renamed our joggers given they're kind of comfortable, our WA fit, uh, work from home joggers, basically. Um, so there were, it was definitely interesting. We're also, at the time, we were 100% D to C. Um, so we didn't have too much of a decline in customer demand. If anything, we had an uptick. Uh, now we're in retailers, but we've only been getting in retailers once COVID started kind of getting a little better. Uh, flip, I'm, I'm the complete flip side of that um so uh since we do we specialize in bespoke or up until that point we did pretty much as high-end custom suiting it's very hard to uh have a it's a it's a really it's a product that no one needed for a solid six to nine months so uh it, it kind of like we kind of saw our sales plummet after <laughs> march 15th and it wasn't it was the op exact opposite effect of that um i think we'll we'll certainly get into after 2020 but but uh 2020 was not not a year I'd like to remember it too well. It's okay. <laughs> it's a new year, man. Um, yeah, so so uh, echoing, echoing the supply chain comments, it's, it was, uh, I, I wish I had joggers in 2020, for example. Uh, we were supposed to have joggers in 2020, but due to this COVID, we didn't get them to 2021. And now they've been selling great for us, actually. It's probably one of the best selling products ever, actually. Um, so that's great, but we didn't get them until a year later. So, but, you know, it's good. <laughs> All right, so, um, with your companies, uh, you guys all have kind of unique uh, spins on what you're doing. So I'm going to start with Tommy. So Tommy, you have a uh, initiative where your 
more eco-friendly. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? And, um, uh, you know, what, what does that, you know, provide for your brand, your mission? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so the two problems we're trying to solve in the active space, first and foremost, I'll uh, touch on the personality first. Uh, the the active is very intense. I'm a sufficiently washed up athlete, so we're trying to be a little bit of the comedic relief in the active space, that's personality wise. The, the issue that we're trying to solve on the supply chain side of things with a lot of humanitarian and environmental issues that have historically plagued the fashion industry. That was my initial inspiration as an unfashionable guy to get into the fashion industry, um, was to address those issues. Um, on the sustainability front, you look at a lot of the existing active brands and or brands in general, there's a lot of sustainability claims, but you look at the metrics, any KPI, whether it's land or, you know, wastewater or um, carbon emissions, it's moving in the opposite direction of sustainable. So it's kind of, uh, there's some logical dissonance there. Um, so specifically what we're doing, we're one of two certified B Corps in the active space, the other being Patagonia. There's also Athleta, but they're owned by Gap, which is a C corporation, so they're a little trickier. Um, we, on the humanitarian side of things, we um, first and foremost just know our supply chain. A lot of the issues exist uh, when, you know, brands get in trouble for uh, worker abuse or, you know, you name your humanitarian abuse. It's often occurring at subcontracted factories. Um, and oftentimes those brands don't even know their clothes are being made there. So we invest, similar to Patagonia, we, we invest time, energy, and resources in knowing our supply chain. We require third-party certificates, specifically SA 8000 or RAP audits or certificates rather, um, we subject them to random audits, uh, random unplanned audits, um, and we restrict subcontracting. Um, so that's some of the, some, and then once we know our supply chain, we're super transparent. We're the first and only active brand to disclose our factory workers' wages. So we disclose the actual wages that our, our uh, factory workers are um, earning, which is important because 2% of factory workers earn a living wage. Um, on the sustainability side, we um, invest in environmentally friendly fabrics to the extent possible. So specifically our workout sets are using recycled nylon and other recycled synthetics. Uh, we have bamboo um, shirts coming out soon. Um, so the extent to we, which we can incorporate, you know, kind of sustainability into our product line we do. Uh, we have plastic repackaging. Our packaging uses algae ink instead of petroleum based inks. Um, we carbon offset all shipments. Um, so there's a whole, oh, and then we donate 1% of sales to environmental NGOs. We're, we're a member of the 1% from the planet. Awesome. And then for ESQ, I, I would think the unique aspect of what I've seen is your customization. And even more with your customization, your lining is super unique. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, I ESQ was started really as a, uh, it was started as a passion project. It was a it, an issue that existed in uh, in menswear, especially when I was practicing practicing law, I would go and try to find designer suits or try other custom suit places myself. And it just never really came out. I never got something I really, really thought was a good product. And, and a lot of that just learning through but through the industry is that uh, in, in custom suiting, at least, uh, probably 80% of the US market uses three or four different manufacturers. So it's all the exact same product and they just stick a different label on it. So with that, uh, I decided to invest in my own factory. Um, we have, so we have a factory for our suiting and shirting. We decided to do it the traditional way, which isn't running everything through a sewing machine. Um, when we, the way that suit is made, you can probably finish a suit from start to finish in an assembly line process. It, it takes about four hours per suit. For us, it takes over 40. So we literally stitch everything by hand. So every stitch you see is sewn by hand. Um, what it does is, Combining that with taking the finest fabrics from around the world, um, from Italy and England, it allows proper proper give for softer fabrics or looser weaves, et cetera. Um, so in terms of suiting, I guess we are more on the sustainable side, just like just like Tommy mentioned. Um, it's something that we we do still have limited waste, but the customization really just came from uh, how, how can we how can we be different? Everyone wants at least for the last decade, I mean, it, it's become a little bit more affordable towards normal people, normal people, if you will. Um, and everyone just kind of wants their own sense of style. So we decided, hey, we don't want to do it on the outside of the suit. Uh, we don't, we're not here to make clown suits, but we can have some fun on the linings. Uh, it got picked up by ESPN when we started doing some things for guys in the NFL draft. Um, nowadays, it's most common for our wedding clientele. We put like engagement photos and stuff like that inside. Uh, it's a really cool sublimation on silk process. It's 
it's actually really tedious, but it creates a really unique product. Yeah, it really adds to the bespokeness of your brand. So it, yeah. kudos to that. And then for Eric, uh, for you, your brand is for a particular type of person. Yeah. Can you uh, elaborate on that for sure, us? Sure. So long story short, pun intended. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, you know, you think about the clothing industry as a whole, you have regular clothing, obviously, big and tall, plus size petite, but you don't have a petite or a short for men. Obviously, short men like myself exist. <laughs> and if you, you know, I were to the mall right now, there's not a single store or section in department store that carries clothing specifically made for shorter men. Because again, obviously, if you're plus size or big and tall, right, you actually have clothing made for people of those body types. So it would make sense to have the same thing for shorter men, but it doesn't really exist, honestly, I think for a lot of reasons, right? But that's why we started Ashenary to be that really first major brand to, to do that. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And then so I would say for uh, inspiring uh, fashion nieces out there or aspiring fashion brands, um, can you tell us like, what are some of the things that you would say for a person to start? Like, what are some of the things that they should be aware of or, um, you know, down the road, some things that you may have faced that you definitely would want someone to understand. Hmm. If you're starting your own company in, uh, in space of fashion, I think I would say patience. Um, <laughs> you know, I think obviously COVID has delayed things a lot, but even pre COVID, I've been working on this. We got our first samples in like summer of 2018 and we publicly launched about nine months ago. So I'm approaching three years of working on this and it feels like we're just kind of getting, things are starting to come together. Um, and the persistence, I think you can weather the storm, if you will, um, if you're passionate about it. You know, if you really like the field and feel passionate about what you're doing, it doesn't feel like work. So um, I would say persistence and patience something that I would recommend having for your own space. Um, I would say carving out your own niche. I think we all have a niche in what we do um, and, and not trying to focus on what other people necessarily have done in the past to be successful. Obviously, you want to look at that, but don't try to copy, copy or emulate that because you're going to have your own ideas. You're going to have the way you want to do things. Uh, it's kind of just you can you can see like what everyone is doing, but if, if the comp unless the company is public, you really don't know what they're doing. Uh, I think what the pandemic has shown, especially in my industry, that a lot of people were not profitable. A lot of a lot of my competitors <laughs> went under because you look at them and you're like, oh, they're doing all these great things. But at the end of the day, it's it's all you know, it's all just just a facade. Um, so just focus on what you're doing well, and you know, if people, I, I always like to say, uh, and this is going to be true of anyone who's had any kind of success. I embrace the haters. Uh, if they're talking about you, it means you're worth talking about. You don't have to worry about those people. Embrace the haters, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> That's good advice. So uh, I would say that, you know, people, I think people think making clothing is sort of an easy thing. You know, it's very physical and it seems tangible, but like, I think once you actually get into it and understand the process, it's actually one of the hardest things to do, I think, from a supply chain standpoint. Uh, I think we can all attest to that, especially right now. Like, for example, China has been closed for basically like a week now, um, and it's still closed. I think to, to this day, right? For example, right, it's because COVID going on. So COVID's not over, unfortunately, and like that really screws us over, <laughs> you know, for, 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 for certain things. So it, it's it's a very like when I started Ashenary, I had no I had no knowledge of fashion. You know, I I still can't sew. You know, um, like we, we, the way it started actually is that we wanted to test the idea. So we actually did a crowdfunding campaign. Where we said, hey, we're gonna make this shirt off that's untucked shirt, right? That's made for shorter men. We didn't have a pattern or anything into that point, right? We, we wanted to just test the water here, right? So we just I took like a, a gap shirt that fit my co-founder decently well. And I just photoshopped the logo off, basically. <laughs> and then we basically that was our product, right? And you know, we're one test the waters and and uh, you know, that sold like pretty pretty pre sold like I think uh come on, come on shirts that way, right? It's like I think 20, 30 grand of, of sales, right? And we're like, wow, people actually want this, you know, and, and then spent nine months figuring out how to actually make clothes, because that's a whole process in itself, right? And um, something I think that you really want, I think you should be sure you want to get into that. <laughs> it's, it's not easy. Um, and as Tommy said, yeah, it's, it's, it can be very frustrating because production orders take three to four months at best sometimes. Um, so 
you know, you're talking about a lot of money up front, right, to get inventory that you hope to sell in a 90 day period, right, to recoup the losses and buy another round of inventory, that kind of stuff. Um, so it's a very challenging industry, I'll say. I mean, you should do it if you like it, but it's not, I would, I would approach it with some caution and understanding of what the industry is. <laughs> How about that? Hey, that's some real advice. Yeah. You know, um, you're not here to sugarcoat anything for anybody, and this is information that they need to know yeah, if they want to <laughs> kind of dive in a little bit. I, I I appreciate the honesty. So so tell me, um, when it comes to social media and your presence out in social media, how does that impact your brand and uh, kind of you know tell us a little bit about that? You talked a little bit about haters and. What are some of the flip side of that when it comes to social media? Do you know what happened? I don't know. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> it feels very relevant right now. Um, so we made a viral TikTok. We had like 150 followers on TikTok. Usually we get like 20 views and uh, made a silly video kind of talking about Gen Z email jargon. And uh, it went viral. We have, I think at this point, like 20, on TikTok alone, maybe like 15, 16 million views. And then Instagram, maybe another 15, 16. BuzzFeed did an article. Um, it went very viral. Um, but then uh, Inc. did an article trying to cancel me, um, basically because it was like, we only hire Gen Z. First of all, first of all we don't. Just It was a silly video. Um, but yeah, I mean, I had to suffer the repercussions and I was getting blasted on LinkedIn um, for only hiring Gen Z, even though, even though we don't, but, um, but yeah, so there's pros and cons. I mean, it, it did result in a surge of awareness and sales, but conversely, or the, the bad side was, you know, more visibility, more potential haters. And yeah, so it was crazy <laughs> reading. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah I don't know if we could do that right now. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you knew that. But I, I heard about that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's what I do, man. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, it just shows you like, yeah. the power. Uh, so, uh, any, any PRSPR, PR, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, I, I hate social media personally. Uh, I don't want to use it. I wouldn't be on it at all if I didn't. If I had my my way. Um, but it's good. It's 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 good for publicity, even for our our product, our core product through the years, which is not really a social. It's not something we're going to sell on social media. Um, when we're selling, we're selling a three thousand dollars suit as opposed to a thirty dollars t-shirt. Um, but we are getting into it. We're getting into e-commerce as well, so it's something that we're going to continue to leverage, especially the people that we've dressed over the years. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's not something I, I work on nowadays. That's for sure. Yeah, so similar boat to us. We're you know, customer actually is a little older. Actually, maybe it's just forty for us. Actually, given our price point. So, um, but you know, we do do a lot of Facebook and TikTok as well now. Um, and I think actually uh, shorting spring is like a new trending thing, right? And you know, I, I think that there's a lot of room for like, as a brand for shorter men, um, there's a lot of room for us to sort of break the ceiling on that, if you will. Like the body positivity movement really has focused on plus as women mainly so far, right? But I think that shorter men should be part of the discussion as well, I would say. And I think um, uh, shorting spring probably is the first like, viral trend i've seen that we can sort of capitalize on and sort of change the discussion which i think, which I think is great um, like the analogy i use like is you know i've watched a show friends in the 90s right you know there are a ton of short and fat jokes in that show i'm sure but you can't make a fat joke today you could cancel rightfully so which is great but you can still make a danny DeVito joke right and everyone laughs and that's not it's not cool you know so i want to change that discussion right and you know make it cool to be a short basically <laughs> that's one of our goals for our brand yeah, I might be aging myself a little bit, but I remember, so when it comes to magazines, how important magazines were in the mm -hmm. 90s. So for me, sometimes when it comes to fashion, I feel like social media is the magazine of the fashion companies. So I think sometimes people view it through mm -hmm. that lens. And then even for you, I like your personal emails or your personal social media that you share with your family yeah, and yeah, stuff yeah. like that's that. That's private. And it, but, <laughs> but, and maybe but it shouldn't be. It, you know, it, but for, for that, you know, it links, you know, who you are as a person. So as people get to yeah. know your brand, they get to know who you are. Um, so I want to dive into the state of the future for your companies. Where do you see yourself ultimately in, in 
where you want to be uh, in the in the future state for you. What are some things that are happening um, down the road here? Um, for us, uh, I really how far down the road? Like uh, like ten years from now, or uh, it could be what you're working on right now. Okay. Yeah. Or right. It could be something that you're trying to achieve. Okay. Um, I'll answer both. So right now. Uh, we have pretty, we're pretty confident with our like, proof of concept, if you will. So now we're trying to expand our product offerings, expand our team, specifically hire a chief marketing officer, someone that can manage our social media accounts. Similar to them, I don't enjoy running uh, the TikTok or any of the social media accounts. Um, and I'd also don't good have at it, though. What'd you say? Heard you were good at it. <laughs> oh, oh. Yeah, so hopefully we can have someone that knows what they're doing um, to manage those accounts and not get me canceled. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so that's a near term goal. Um, I get more into, we're getting into retailers. So we're trying to get into more retailers. Um, th those are short term goals. Long term, I would love to be like the Patagonia of act where I think I love Patagonia. That's probably my favorite brand from a supply chain standpoint. They just truly do the right thing behind closed doors. Um, so yeah, I kind of want to be like the, the Patagonia of act where long term. Nice. I don't, I don't have a 10 year plan um it's I, i'm i'm you got really, new stuff coming up I, we do have new new things coming out tell we us are, a little bit about that we are in, in the process of transitioning our business which is currently about 90 percent custom and 10 percent off the rack and i want to get to a, get it to a point where it's the inverse of that um and we're going to do that on the backs of uh our, our our latest product it's called it's called our, our bamboo dress shirt um, so first of its kind in a dress shirt application, uh, it's odor resistant, wrinkle resistant, moisture wicking, machine washable, it's more sustainable than cotton, it's cooler than cotton, softer, um, all in a package where we can compete with your traditional or with these performance dress shirts that are just pure polyester that don't that you can't really wear with a suit. Um, so it's a first to market product. We've been offering for our custom clients for about two years and have had such great response. We decided to try it. Uh, we've been doing it for about three months now. It's gotten picked up by Forbes, by Gear Patrol, by Fast Company, or I, I could probably say this. It comes out next next month and Fast Company is a world changing idea. Um, so that's kind of where we're transitioning. Uh, our custom side isn't going anywhere, but we want we want to scale this. Nice. Scoop. Yeah, scoop. <laughs> um, so you, you know, heard we, it first <laughs> here at I break the news. So you know, we've been primarily online to UC, which has been great, and we've been growing a lot. Um, COVID twenty twenty obviously was a bit of a roadblock for us. We still grew that year not as much as we wanted to, right? But I think last year we sort of got back on track, and we're on poised to keep growing a lot, which is great. I personally think actually retail. I know people think retail is dead, right? But I think retail actually is the future for us in the next couple of years, where we can really kill it there. I think right, doing our own stores in specific cities, right? Because I think that. I know COVID has changed the game a bit here, but I think buying clothing online where fit is so important, that's it's impossible. You know, we have fit calculators and we try our best to do that. We have free returns exchanges, but you can't replicate that touch and feeling around fit, especially where if you walk into a store, you can do that. So I think that's at some point for us very soon, probably going to be, I'm excited to try to explore that very soon, I would say. So um, I'm going to uh, go back to you, uh, Eric. Mm -hmm. So Talk to us a little bit more. I want to hear a little you, as you yeah. guys are talking. Uh, tell us a little bit more about your customer, because sure. I, I feel like with all your brands, you're you're very honed in on your on your customer, which is so important when it comes to the fashion industry. So just kind of talk to us a little bit about your customer. Who is your customer, and and why they're so loyal to your brands? Yeah. So the nice thing with us is that if you're short, you buy our clothing that fits. Where else are you gonna go? So in some ways, you know, we have customer for life, which is great. And our, our lifetime value is amazingly high for that reason. And also repeat order rates great for that reason as well. And so, um, you know, we have a very low customer base, we can, which we talk to quarterly, right? About, you know, product stuff and the marketing stuff, right? Which is great. So we have a lot of good knowledge of who they are, what they want and all that stuff. So for example, our immediate customer is 40, right? Live in urban areas, work in, you know, financial creative fields where they can wear these kind of outfits to work every day, right? Into the bar afterward. That's kind of our customer currently. Um, yeah. I'm going to add on to that. I think customer ret uh, retention. Ret retention is probably one of the biggest things. Uh, in terms of this bamboo shirt that we've had, we have it in white, blue, and polka dot, and it's the only three colors, colors that we have. 
uh, for our custom clientele is 38%. And for the three months that we've been doing it online, uh, it's been 23%. So I think there's nothing stronger than that. If you can get, yeah. like what you said, well, well, the core of our business has really been been, been built on return clientele. Like, like same thing, if we can make you a perfect suit, yeah. where else are you gonna go, right? Yeah, not, not that too technical, right? But like paid advertising right now has changed a lot in the past year, I would say, right? With iOS 14 privacy changes. So. Um, I know it's for technical, right? But like, that's changed the game a lot, I think, for a lot of DDC brands, probably like ours, right? They're trying to scale online, especially when it comes to user data, right? Being able to target certain people in certain ways. Um, so that really means that own data, right? So first part, you have emails and, you know, phone numbers, right? It's super, it's even more important than it's ever been. And having a really good bottom funnel, middle, middle funnel, right, for, for your sales funnel is 100 times more important than it was a year ago. What was the initial question again? Uh, your customer. <laughs> your customer. Oh, who is our target customer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me a little bit about your customer. Yeah, so our customer. Because your customer is, they're active, but they're, yeah, they're more yeah, aware. Our yeah, yeah, yeah. So our target customer, basically, I think a lot of the existing active brands cater to the aspirational pro athlete or um, like a gym rat type. Um, we're trying to be basically the actual brand for anyone past the age of 22 that is not pursuing a career in professional sports. Uh, the tagline we've recently been using is people that go pro in something other than sports, kind of spinning <laughs> off of uh, the NCAA's slogan. Um, but yeah, we're trying to be a less intense, you know, the reality of the situation for myself is I go on like casual runs from time to time. I play rec soccer in adult leagues. I, I kind of work out and exercise to stay in shape and have fun. and as much for mental health as physical health. Um, my mom goes on walks for exercise. She has a bad back. Um, so just like the current active market, how intense it is, just doesn't resonate anymore. Um, so we're basically trying to be a little bit more of a laid back, uh, almost comedic, somewhat irreverent, um, you know, active brand in that regard. So if our, going back to our, to our customer, anyone that's, you know, it's, I would assume, unless anyone here is pursuing a, Professional, you know, uh, career in sports. Um, you know, pretty much everyone here. You know. Okay. So uh, this is going to be my last question, and I'm going to uh, bring it out to the crowd for uh, questions. So, with uh, professionals are a little bit different now when it comes to their work. You know, people are remote. People are, you know, uh, a lot more active now uh, than they've ever been. Now that we can go out, people are. You know, traveling, they're going on to events, they're opening it up. So tell me, how does that affect your industry uh, as a whole? Yeah, it's difficult for us to tease out the impact of COVID and the recent changes in the industry just because we're so new. We've only existed largely during COVID. So I don't have the data points pre and post, pre, during, and post COVID. Um, things have, are definitely moving in the right direction and there seems to be sufficient demand and we've been growing without any paid ads. Again, to your point, paid ads are kind of terrible right now. Mm -hmm. Luckily, we've been able to grow without that, just on word of mouth um, and some earned media and TikToks and stuff. Um, but, you know, I things are going well and it demand, it continues to increase. But again, take that with a grain of salt just because I don't have any data points pre-COVID. Uh, I think in terms of men's suiting, it's, it's making quite a comeback and I think it'll continue that way. Uh, I think uh, as I think work from from home is here to stay. And when you're working from home, this is great. This is what I wear most of the time, honestly. It's but when you're going to be client facing, I think business casual is going to kind of go by the wayside. I think jeans uh, in the office, especially when you're client facing is going to be a no no. I think especially for our lawyers our finance guys. Uh, whenever you're client facing, they're going to really expect you to look the part. The one blessing that COVID has had is guys have either gotten bigger or smaller. Very few people have stayed the same size. So uh, they kind of had to order some new clothes as well. So, um, but I mean, for work, but I think we've seen a shift in what men are wearing suits for as well. And, and women for that matter. It's not necessarily just for the office. Now it's for so social occasions. Um, we've had a huge uptick in weddings because everyone kind of condensed weddings into last year and now. Um, but I think it's it's making quite a comeback and it will continue. Yes, we were um, considering making suits uh, in 2020 and COVID happened and we're probably never going to make suits at this point, <laughs> I would say, as an impact wise. 
Um, and, you know, we're definitely leaning more into the athleisure. Um, I mean, we're always a casual everyday kind of brand as it is, but I think that we're, we're focusing more on that even more than previously, I would say, from the uh, pre COVID, the after COVID. Um, but yeah, I, I do think that uh, this is casual wear is here to stay as well. Like chinos are, are still a thing, you know, dress shirts, mm -hmm. or at least like sort of formal shirts is still a thing for sure, right? Um, so I think that it's not going to go away completely for sure. Um, we were, yeah. I guess I meant the lawyers and you know, oh, like the, sure. yeah, the, the world, uh, yeah, yeah, my, 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 uh, my old crowd. Yeah. yeah I, I know there's companies cracking down on people to be suited and booted for their, um, zoom meetings and things like that. So that's going around. So you'll probably see a, in my a little professional like, opinion seems a little unnecessary. I mean, you're in front of a computer. Yeah, I mean, wear what, wear, wear what you want to wear. That's just what I would say, you know. Hey, that's that's what I heard. <laughs> They're cracking you know? down. But New York is New York. They don't want you to oh, show up true, for the true. Zoom meetings. <laughs> yeah. No more pajamas, people. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's go to the crowd. Um, the first question is really cool. Uh, what are some challenges that uh, you face in the industry that saturate with fast fashion, Amazon, eco-friendly, high-end brands? Um, what 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 is the return rate? Oh, return rate of uh, let me understand. closing. So, what are some challenges that you face in the industry that is saturated with fast fashion, Amazon, eco? Uh, can somebody elaborate on that? The uh, I'm trying to understand the question. I saw this article the other day that Shein is pretty much single handedly destroying the environment on their own. <laughs> They produce some something like seven hundred percent more waste than uh, H and M and Zara combined. It's crazy. All right, let's go to the next question. <laughs> so 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 what i understand is so what do you think about some of those brands like you know that are can see your products produce it faster and then get it out to the consumer yeah so i, I can't speak for all of us but i think i kind of can right because none of us are fast fashion in terms of customer base right right and i think we're just different customer base like the person buying fast fashion isn't going to buy our clothing given our price points and that's simply that, right? And there's enough customers, I think, right, that are differentiated enough, right, where you're not competing for the same person necessarily. I mean, for certain items, maybe, right, but generally you're not going to be a person buying a $20 pair of joggers, right, is never going to buy our $150 pair, pair of jeans. That's just not going to happen, right? And that's okay. I think we have enough customer differentiation, and, and uh, it's, it's, it's a different person, basically. So I'm not that worried about it. Um, and return rates, honestly, for us, actually, are pretty good. Like, we're, like, I don't know. 15% I'd say right, which I think is way below industry average, honestly. So it's pretty good and I'm pretty happy with that. And one thing I'll add is just, you know, one of the main, you know, one of the biggest contributors to some of the environmental issues that exist in fashion is just how many clothes we buy. I think 85% end up in landfills. It's just, you know, investing in high quality, relatively timeless pieces is really important, you know, when you're trying to fight a lot of the environmental issues. It's just a lot of the issues just come from too much stuff out there, mm -hmm. which is difficult for me to palate, you know, kind of swallow just because we are, I'm creating an act we're, we're all creating brands that are producing more stuff. The only way we're going to create a positive impact is if people buy our stuff instead of mm -hmm. not in addition to other brands. Um, and so some of the stuff we do, we intentionally invest in timeless pieces. We've sold the same shorts since December, 2019 versus today. We made some improvements, but they're pretty much the same shorts. Um, so, you know, we have, we're pretty seasonless. We don't really go by seasons, um, in stark contrast to Shein and the fast fashion brands, which come out with new styles. They're very trendy and, and they're coming out with new styles every week. It seems like, so it went from a four season, you know, calendar to now they have 52, you know, every week is a new trend. Um, 
So that's one of the biggest issues in, in my eyes of, of the fashion industry when it comes to sustainability. It's just the sheer amount of products out there, which when you're buying cheap, trendy clothing is, is problematic. Um, and the only proactive thing you can do when you're a brand is education, you know, trying to educate people to convert the people that currently buy Shein and, and try to help them understand why that's so problematic. Yeah, I, I think you guys do a really good job of, of narrowing your market and making sure people understand your message and what you're about to where it draws people to your mission and what you're about is almost customized, right? Yes. <laughs> All right, so the next question is, uh, uh, there's another question about, oh yeah, how much capital do you need to, uh, for the, your upfront, uh, how much capital do you need up front to get started for a manufacturing perspective? Would you have changed anything if you did it uh, again from the beginning? So that is a challenge when it comes to supply chain for clothing. Um, there are inventory costs and you have to pay up front. That's going to be a that's just how it works in the industry, right? So for example, you know, you're going to put a 50% deposit right on an order of 1,000 shirts, right? It's going to cost you, let's say, 20 grand right up front. Um, so you definitely need capital to do it. Um, we raise capital to do that basically, right? To grow um, at the Shark Tank, right? Um, personally, if you had the money yourself, I wouldn't raise money. <laughs> but you know, as a broke college student at the time, I didn't have any money to put into the business, so we had to raise money. I'm the exact opposite of that. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're entirely self-funded, but it takes time. Um, whereas I'm, uh, we were literally talking about this beforehand in, mm -hmm. in terms of. I would like to potentially, I'm thinking about raising money so we can scale, scale this ready to wear product faster. Um, but I've been doing this for 10 years now. It honestly started with, we take the deposit for one suit, we order that suit, we take the profit and turn it into the next one. And that's how it started. It started in, started in, a, uh, in a converted bedroom. And uh, now we've got, we've got, we're two stores in now. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I think it's, there's, there's always both sides to the coin. Mm -hmm. um yeah i agree with pretty much everything everything that anyone said um you know you the real big not issue but you know the bigger uh capital commitment is going to be your initial inventory um when you're really small like well at least i'll speak for myself like we are um you need to pay for inventory 100 percent up front so you know tr coming up with a name trademarking that name you might spend a thousand dollars you might spend a thousand dollars in incorporation fees whether you're an llc or a c corp or public benefits or whatever um the time it takes for the designer to develop the clothes it might be a thousand dollars so you might spend like five thousand dollars in setting up the business but the real cost is just your initial inventory um which you, you know our moq minimum order quantity is 300 to 500 depending on the factory per style, per color. So, you know, if you want to launch black shorts, and that's it, you know, 300 units times, let's just call it $15 landed cost. It's 40, you know, basically $5,000. Yeah. Um, so that's just one product, one color. So it depends on, it depends, you know, on like how many products you want to launch with. Um, but yeah, I'd say the biggest capital constraint initially, and we're still dealing with this is networking capital issues, basically the fact the simple fact that you need to pay for inventory four months before you you can start selling it and recouping some of that money. And, and add to that, because of COVID still going on, right? And China being closed, for example, last week, we're ordering fall inventory this year now. So we're doing like nine months. Normally that you want to turn around inventory like three months usually, right? Like per season, we're ordering stuff like nine months, six months at a time, just, just in case. Because we've learned from last two years where you don't have inventory. Like I have joggers for a whole year for 2020. We missed that probably hundred thousands of revenue right there, you know. So it, it's it is like there's some substantial costs, and that's why you know at a certain point you get inventory financing, which is great, you know, or loans, right, or raise money. So to dive into since we're on the numbers, let's go into the are you profitable, and then what is your five year uh, goal or exit strategy? So, so I know for okay. Tommy, is you know you're you're, you're just kind of in it. Yeah, you're just you just hit the uh, what, nine months. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're we're not profitable. Hopefully, there's no investors in this room. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, so it's tricky because you're unprofitable. At least for us, we're unprofitable 
and we have networking capital issues. So we have we have to take on equity financing to subsidize the early years. Hopefully, you know, there's some fixed costs like product development, paying the fashion designers and um, general overhead. There's a lot of fixed costs that with time and scale we'll be able to offset. Um, might be another three, four years, I'd imagine, until we're profitable. The goal is definitely to be profitable. So I, I don't really enjoy raising capital. Um, it's not like a fun process, at least for myself. Um, so the goal is definitely to be profitable. Patagonia's done it, Albert has done it. I'm naming other public benefit corporations. So um, I know it's possible. Um, that's definitely our, um, a goal, um, but I'd imagine it'll be another three, four years for us probably. Uh, we are profitable, but I would like to scale at this point. Um, like I said, if we can switch from, switch our, our, our current ratio of 90% custom, 10% off the rack. And if we can flip that, that would be, a, that'd be really good for us. And that's, that's currently the five year plan. Yeah, it's always a balance of how much cash you want to burn to grow faster versus being profitable. That's sort of the big question, I think, when it comes to GDC especially. Um, and so, you know, we actually were profitable last year, um, barely. I think it's like $1,000, something like that, right? But, mm -hmm. but technically very pop, 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 profitable, yeah, which is great. Um, and, you know, we're, I mean, even this year, trying to figure out that balance of how much you want to spend on marketing, right, for example, to grow a little faster, right, versus how profitable you want to be. That's, that's a constant question that we're dealing with. Honestly, on a daily basis, honestly. So, and some of these questions are intense. You guys, <laughs> you guys want to know oh, everything? Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, the exit strategy. So, so what I'm gonna do is, uh, I, I want to know um, how do you stay on top of the trends? There are a lot of trends out there in the fashion industry. Um, it seems like you guys are dialed into your customer base. So, how do you? stay on top of trends uh we don't um, <laughs> um somewhat joking um but yeah we specifically invest in pretty timeless pieces you know this is a, an athletic shirt probably will sell this for the next three four years assuming athletic shirts don't quite a style um our men's shorts we might change the inseam length a little bit right for example like now guys like in general a little bit of a shorter short so we just take off an inch, but the short is the same. Um, so, you know, also that's the part of the designers, they kind of are on top of the trends, but all the designers that we have are very much kind of have uh, adopted that same mentality of we need a brand that's not trendy, um, you know, that's gonna invest in um, timeless pieces. So we're kind of intentionally not trendy. <laughs> Uh, I'm probably in the most untrendy of uh, of fashion. Uh, I, I, men's men's fashion, in terms of suiting, changes maybe every decade, every decade of 15 years or so. Uh, I think we are back to the 80s right now, where su suiting was pretty good. We got into the 90s when everything got cartoonishly big Boxing. and long, uh, and then we got into the early 2000s when or, or late late two late 2000s when everything got comically small and it doesn't fit anybody i think we're at a point now where like let's let's make things that are trim but still still fit well so um hopefully it stays this way for a little bit because uh, I, I like this yeah one of the things that i is trending right now is is bag your pants right and i hate that for short men because <laughs> yeah. short men do not look good in bag your pants um so you know as time said we're not really on trend we we've, we've we're on trend we're not trendy as a brand i think given our customer base you know we're going after people who they care, but don't care that much, you know. Um, they're not on TikTok looking at the fashion trends per se. Um, and they want sort of timeless pieces where they can wear, like we've been selling the same pair of jeans for six years now. It's a best line product, right? And that's phenomenal, right? And I think I could probably do that for forever, honestly. <laughs> and that's great. All right, next question. How do you each feel about uh, starting small and sacrificing quality or even design? in the beginning to get your brand off the ground. I I don't think you sacrifice quality, though. I yeah, I don't think you <laughs> sacrifice quality. I mean, the, the, the fashion industry is so saturated and competitive. You need to give them you can't give them an excuse why they would go to another brand. If anything, you know, you're, for example, when we started out and, and still to this day, I'm, I'd be shocked if you guys have maybe you've seen the TikTok, but you know, I'd be shocked if you've heard of Fox Robin. So 
I don't think you can sacrifice quality. I it's just too saturated of a market. We we also don't need more stuff in the world, and if we do, we need we need more higher quality, long lasting, durable goods. Um, so my answer to that would be do not sacrifice quality. Uh, when I started, I thought I thought we had the best quality, and the reason why I know all about our manufacturing or, or our competitors, where everything is made, is because um, that's how I started. You find someone online that's easy to find a manufacturer, and that's that's how that's how I started. And at the time, I thought it was really good. Uh, about four years in, we went through a complete rebrand because you just learn more about the industry. Uh, what I consider myself one of my biggest um, things. For my, a thing I advise is like, you want to go see how everything is made and you want to know the in, every in and out, ins and outs of your product. So what I've done is uh, to date, I've been to 183 factories globally. Uh, that's between manufacturing fabrics and everything else, just to see exactly how everything is made. And we've been able to invest that, then we were able to invest in our own, our own factories to make a product that we're actually proud of. Yeah, I think unless you're in fast fashion, you don't intentionally want to sacrifice quality, I would say. I mean, you know, pr production problems happen, and that's why you need third party QC. You need to go to the factory, you need to know your partners. It's challenging, obviously, when you're a smaller brand. Um, but that's why you go to, like, you know, fashion, like Magic, right? You go to sourcing shows, and you have some, you know, accountability there, right? But um, obviously, the COVID's been challenging. Um, but yeah, it's a, I mean, supply, <laughs> supply chain doesn't get easier the bigger you get. I'll say that. Supply chain is a, is a full time job for a whole team. Like, I mean, I mean, Target has thousands of employees working on supply chain constantly and daily, right? And, and things still go wrong. Um, so it's not something you can ever put to bed and say, it's good, right? It's, gonna it's a constantly evolving monster that you have to solve the fires at all the time. It's just part of the nature of the beast. Yeah, and to go back on some of the trends, I feel like with your brands, you guys have some lasting brand um, work because that you know your customer like more than other brands that are out there so for you you don't necessarily have to pivot you just continue to talk to your customer right yeah it's a yeah. good assessment uh we're we're not pivoting we're just adding on yeah, yeah. yeah. that's good yeah. yeah you another line <laughs> uh you know just a little added value um so to go into uh what eric was saying uh, what are some mistakes that you wish you could have avoid when you started the journey uh, in your fashion industry? Oh boy, a lot of mistakes. Um, <laughs> um, I, I think that, you know, for me, I, I'm talking about sourcing a lot, but I think your product is your business for apparel. So that's like the most important, you have to have a good product. Um, either it's quality and or fit, depending on the brand, of course, right? Obviously for us, fit is everything. Because if it doesn't fit you, then why would you buy our clothing versus any other normal brand? So, um, you know, getting that consistently, I think, is a big, big challenge and something that we've learned a lot of lessons over in terms of working with factories and with supply chains of what not to do, how to manage them and terms and all that stuff, right? It's just, uh, it's, a, it's a challenge. Yeah. Uh, my only regret, regret is probably starting a little later than I sh would have liked. Uh, I, I've had this idea really since college because I've put on suits in college and I was like, I don't look like any of these guys in the magazine or nothing fits me like this. Little did I know there's no pinning and there's no Photoshop uh, <laughs> a lot a lot, or a lot of Photoshop. Uh, I honestly had this idea in college, um, but I then worked for a year, then went to law school and then graduated and then practiced practice for a year. So it was a little delayed, but I mean, better late than never. Yeah, I would say, I mean, you're gonna, if you're gonna start a company, you're gonna make mistakes. That's first and foremost, I'm thinking of specific mistakes I made. And I don't know that you can, if you can build a business without making mistakes and kudos to you. But, um, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking of specific, like we did a Kickstarter and we paid a third party to help market the Kickstarter. Yeah. That was a huge mistake. It cost like $10,000 <laughs> and they did, I think they brought in one customer, if that, and they, that was even sketchy. Cause like I could, we couldn't really tell who brought that <laughs> customer in. <laughs> so it literally was $10,000 down the drain. Um, so that was like a specific mistake. Um, I would say just trust your gut. I would say all the times I've trusted my gut, even before I hired that third party Kickstarter, I just, you know, I felt weird about it, but they really hyped it up. 
So I would just say really trust your gut, be confident in what you're building. Um, and you're going to make mistakes, but persistence, going back to persistence is key. I mean, right. have a good team though. Like have a co-founder, I would say that. Because I mean, you don't have to have one, but I would, I, I could not have done this without co-founder personally. Ha having the right team is everything. Yeah, because therefore gives you the, the ability to make mistakes and recover from them. <laughs> That's the idea at least, so. So here's a financial question. So what are some of your, uh, what is the financial metric KPI do you most care about? Uh, that's an interesting. Question. This is very technical. Should we, I mean, we, we can talk about this. Yeah. So, uh, but what is that? What is that factor that you most care about when it comes to your fashion brand? So for us, um, and this is going to be technical here. I apologize. Um, you know, we know where our life in value. Um, so for us, all we care about is the cost acquiring a customer. So new co the, that's that's all. It's basically all I care about essentially. And as long as the cost is at a certain number, right? We know we're breaking even on first purchase. Therefore, you can scale that budget for paid infinitely, in theory, at least, right? Um, and that's what I'm looking at on a daily basis. Yeah, I'm, I'm new to e-commerce. This is what we're trying to figure <laughs> out, but I think cost, cost of acquisition is everything. Yeah. Same thing, if you have a product that people are gonna go back and buy once you get them in it, I think that's everything. Yeah, I mean, and this is changing. I know with the, I'm sorry, I get technical again, but with iOS 14 prices changes, um, a lot of pay media spending-wise has changed. Uh, we've lost a lot of access to that makes it better data. Like Facebook, for example, reporting wise, is completely useless. <laughs> you can't trust a single word it says right at this point. All I can tell you is how much you spent and nothing about what results are, is accurate at this point, basically. Um, so, you, you know, you have to really, uh, so a lot of people are talking about, you know, MER, right? Or, you know, what is your overall uh, blended return on ad spend essentially, right? And that's helpful, yes, but in the end of the day, right, you know, that includes things that are not paid. So you kind of want to, let, a lot of agencies out there would tell you right to focus only on that right and uh that's not i, I don't i personally agree with that. i think there, there's you have to really understand those metrics and understand that better um and don't let someone else convince you otherwise because they're, they're wrong <laughs> so. um i'll answer it two parts the parts i'm forced to care about which i do also care about is revenue um for this stage it's whether you're talking to a potential investor whether you're trying to get debt financing uh, whether you're negotiating, renegotiating payment terms with factories. So like I said, we pay for inventory 100% upfront. Eventually I would love to have net 30 terms, basically start paying for a portion of the inventory after we've received it mm -hmm. and can start recouping some revenue from it. Um, for a whole host of reasons, you know, pro even our path to profitability, we need to scale. So for a whole host of reasons, mm -hmm. revenue and top line is by far the KPI, that key performance indicator. If anyone um, needs to know that, what that means um, is by far the KPI that I care most about because I, we have to, and I do care about that. But other metrics that are less relevant to the other constituents and more relevant for myself just personally are product reviews, uh, customer retention, how happy the customers are. I care a lot about just like our customers being happy, um, which is somewhat intangible sometimes. But uh, for a concrete kpi revenue at this point so to go on to customers a little bit looks like paul you you, you got some cha uh, challenging questions <laughs> for these guys uh, uh, do you budget your ca uh, ca C C C relative to the customer for your lt how closely do you track or repeat in order to accurate measure the value of one customer acquisition? So the answer is yes, at least for us, the answer is yes. We, we so since the iOS change is right, um, I spent a lot of money and time finding better ways to get better information on how paid media is doing. So um, it, at this point, I'm, I'm pretty confident in saying that uh, we can track paid revenue actually decently well. Since I know that, you know, if I spent X amount of dollars on Facebook or TikTok, it's bringing me Y in return. Um, so, so yeah, we definitely, that's that's what I look at every day, basically, from a, from a daily spend standpoint. Yes. Uh, everything's new <laughs> again. Like getting in, it's it's so much more. Um, we do track data in terms of like our custom clothing business, but it's such more individualized on the client. We, um, but as as we get into ecom, and the more I'm learning, it's all it's all numbers driven. It's yeah. it's all numbers driven, and you can learn so much from the more data you can gather, the more you're going to learn from that.
it's like, you know, if infinite money, right, you can spend for the money to grow and get a sale. It's just not very efficient. Right? And that's sort of the, the question mark right now is how efficient is your spending? That's the big question. And uh, I know there's students in the room. I did not know this when I was a student. So I'll just explain like LTV. L LTV is lifetime value of, uh, of a customer. So it's basically if you get a random, you know, a first time purchaser, what is that worth to you? What are you willing to spend to get a customer? Is that is that customer worth $50? Is that customer worth $1,000? So that's what it's trying to calculate. And then CAC is cost to acquire a customer. So if you spend thousand dollars on paid Instagram ads, how many customers are you going to acquire? Mm -hmm. If you acquire 10 customers, you on average spent a hundred dollars to acquire each customer. So your CAC in that instance is a hundred dollars, just to give you guys context. Um, and typically industry norm would say you want lifetime value to, relative to your CAC to be a roughly three to one ratio mm -hmm. is, I don't know who came up with that number, but it's <laughs> ratio. Um, to answer the question, we currently don't do paid ad spend. We just, well, we just started, we spent, we probably cumulatively spent like less than $500. So we're, we don't really have a sophisticated answer on CAC yet. Our next post, our next fundraising round, we're going to start experimenting across channels. You can, whether it's Google or, you know, influencers or Instagram or TikTok, you know, we're going to have a different CAC across platforms. So we're going to be pouring money into those various channels to learn where we have the lowest CAC and most efficient spend to fuel growth. Um, so TBD on that <laughs> answer and CBD on lifetime value. We just haven't been around long enough to, you know, our customer retention is really high. Um, average order size is, you know, we have a rough idea of what that is now, but once we increase our product offerings, I expect that'll probably increase. Um, so that is also TBD for us as well. Um, <laughs> but we're starting to calculate it, we'll say. All right, this is a little bit more lighter. <laughs> Where do you see the fashion industry going in the next few years? And how do you see the industry changing? I think we talked about that a little bit too. I mean, for us, what I'm seeing is a lot of people are becoming increasingly aware of some of the sustainability and, you know, labor abuse that occurs in the fashion industry. Um, so hopefully that continues and people continually wake up to what is wrong in the fashion industry. and kind of you know use their when people purchase clothing you're essentially voting for what brands you think are doing the right thing so our hope is that people kind of increasingly wake up to these issues and stop buying from the Sheehan's of the world and buy from brands like ourselves but you know that's my optimistic side of things I the pessimistic side of me is you know there's a ton of greenwashing that goes into the industry um every company says they pay fair wages for example but if you look at the industry, they, there's about 2% of workers earn a living wage, in factory workers. Um, you see Nike and Lululemon, or you know, insert your brand here with all these sustainability claims. And it's funny the way the calculation works, they're actually able to say they're um, you know, reducing their carbon footprint, even though overall as a business, they're increasing their carbon in the footprint, which seems counterintuitive, but the way the metric is calculated, they're able to do that as if it's like on a per unit basis, they're decreasing their carbon emissions and I won't get too much into it, but there's a lot of greenwashing in the industry. So the skeptical part of me is, you know, it's so difficult for consumers to differentiate who is doing the right thing behind closed doors. What is sustainability, you know, the, and Patagonia to their credit, stopped using the word sustainable by its very nature. We're creating stuff and it's not, how it's currently produced, it's not sustainable. I think the focus is really on just minimizing our footprint, you know, creating long lasting products, not being fast fashion. Um, long wind, long wind did roundabout <laughs> answer, but we'll see. I don't know. Hopefully it'll move in the right direction on all fronts, but. Uh, I think this is the last question. We're about a minute on time. Uh, um, where is the Southeast Asia for us mainly. So the sewing is done in China, but we source everything globally. So fabric comes from Italy, England, canvas from Germany or Italy, buttons from Japan, uh, lining from Japan. It, it's just sewn in China. Yeah, so we're pretty much everywhere. So Guatemala, Mexico, Turkey, and China are the major countries for us. Uh, depends on the product being made, essentially. All right. Closing remarks, gentlemen. Um, 
We got about thirty seconds. Mm-hmm. Really? Yeah, but we're 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 okay. in time. Four thirty. I just said but just closing remarks. Uh, you can take as much time as you want. Yeah, I would just say thanks for coming. Um, if you want to reach out, my email is Tommy at boxaramba.com. Happy to answer any additional questions. Um, and feel free to reach out about whatever. But thanks. Can I just copy what he said? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, appreciate you guys all coming here. Uh, it's always got, good to come back to campus um, and to ESQ. If you guys need anything, you know anyone getting married or <laughs> needs a nice suit, we, we will help you out. Yeah, short and sweet, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, you know, I think it's a very tough industry to get into. I think that um, it's not tech. <laughs> so the evaluations are not tech either, right? Um, but I think it's very rewarding to work on a physical product, right, where people can wear it and the day, right? And, you know, as you say internally, it fits all confidence, right? Like having wearing clothing that makes you feel confident and is such an awesome feeling, right, where it's essentially life-changing, right? Um, and something that tech really can't always do, I would say, honestly. Um, so I think that's that's rewarding i would say right um well thank you so much for coming and thank you so much for the um questions also and um if you guys have any questions i'm i'm sure they will answer those questions for you outside of uh, the room uh thank you so much for the idea center and university of notre dame for uh having us here and uh you guys have a fantastic day and enjoy this weather (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.